Good afternoon and welcome to the Tuesday night lecture series sponsored by the Natalie and James Thompson Gallery at San Jose State University. Tonight we're delighted to host Rafiq and Adol. The artist will speak for approximately 40 minutes and we'll have a Q&A after. Please post questions to the Q&A function below at any time. Rafiq Anadol, born in 1985 in Istanbul, Turkey, is a media artist, director, and pioneer in the aesthetics of data and machine intelligence. His body of work locates creativity at the intersection of humans and machines. In taking the data that flows around us as the primary material and the neural network of a computerized mind as a collaborator, Anadol paints with a thinking brush, offering us a radical offering us radical visualizations of our digitized memories and expanding the possibilities of architecture, narrative, and the body in motion. An adult site-specific AI data sculptures, live audiovisual performances, and immersive installations take many forms, while encouraging us to rethink our engagement with the physical world, its temporal and spatial dimensions, and the creative potential of machines. And now, Please join me in welcoming Rafiq Anadol. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. I am a little bit jet lagged and great to be here with you today to share my journey. Um, I'll be sharing a short keynote and then happy to take your questions. Give me a second. And again, excuse my jet lag. I just arrived last night super late. I do hope I won't be <laughs> doing too much um, problem on my presentation. Okay. So I'm Rafi Canadol. I'm a media artist. And I'm currently teaching at University of California in Los Angeles, a design media arts department, where I got my uh, degree in seven years ago from the same department. And this is my website and this is my uh, social media handle. You are very welcome to, to join and ask questions or uh, learn more about upcoming projects. I was eight years old when I watched the movie Blade Runner, which I, I guess changed my life. Especially, I was very inspired by the idea of a near future. I was very inspired by the idea of being able to imagine or remember the future. And back in time, at eight years old, I wasn't able to like recognize, honestly, everything about this picture itself. But I remember that the same summer, I got my first computer and I got fully, fully like in love with the machines and computers. And I was very much, you know, addicted to games for many years. What was really inspiring to me in those early days was being able to imagine and enjoy the idea of daydreaming and many others. In my work, instead of just shiny pixels, I'm, as, I'm also heavily inspired by the idea of near future, how technology transforming who we are. Our, our communities, our families, our DNA and gene. I'm also very inspired by how machines are controlling us and how these new systems are surrounding us, how they are like creating whole new discourse and context, especially in the age of machine intelligence. I'm also heavily inspired by the, you know, these surrounding systems and hardwares and softwares and how they are predicting where we go, what we eat, what we say, and what we like, where we go. And this prediction engine is also becoming this interesting challenge of being in this sense of displacement. Sometimes the first thing we see in the morning is a phone, the last thing we see at night is a phone, and our life sometimes goes in between. And in this like challenging world of sense of displacement, I just also think about like, as Joe Meda said, design is a solution to a problem, art is a question to a problem. And for me, the question was much inspiringly simple, but also very heavy. What does it really mean to be a human in the 21st century? And to answer this question, I always focus on an interestingly unique, um, triangle of humans, machines, and environments. And I found inspiring narratives when that triangle happened. And I'm not alone. I'm on the, I'm on the shoulders of many giants. We are now 14 people, can speak 14 language, and we represent 10 different countries. As a studio, we operate from Los Angeles, California. And six years ago, we start our journey. And last six years was so inspiring. And we have been able to create many projects all around the world, mostly permanent projects, mostly like installations using data, AI, and large scale mediated spaces or architectural interventions. And when I work, when I, when I was just showing these images uh, or, or these logos, please do not think that it's like a 
<laughs> sorry, it's like a cliche, you know, startup slide. It is actually, these are the people who are allowing me and my team to work together. And if you remember Renaissance, like how it was invented back in time in 1300 and 1600s, it's a very similar thing. These people are giving us the best algorithm, best brush, sometimes, you know, the best pigment. And then we are just collaborating with them and going beyond what is available. So maybe instead of just taking a one algorithm and making it a boring product, we sometimes take it as an opportunity and transform into a emotional pigmentation of ideas. Our projects are so far have been explored around the world, except Antarctica. We had many, many installations and touched many, many locations in the world. But for me, what is very important is art should be for anyone, any age and any background. And for me, that comes from public art. I don't believe that we will remember 21st century that our people are putting artworks, you know, in galleries or museums, you know, you open a door and behind it, there is art. So I found that public art is an inspiring ways of practicing. And for a public art, there is no age, there is no background, there is no floor, there, no, it's for everyone. In my work, also heavily using simulations, you will see a lot of like installations using these particles. I've been obsessed with this field of like animation simulations, like um, man, maybe now 10 years. I've been using a software called VVVV. It is an open source uh, Windows based um, visual programming language that allows you to create really complex um, installations or, you know, um, some kind of software developments around big data and even interactivity. So what you are seeing in this showreel is basically using this software. And as a studio, we have been also collaborating with uh, wonderful, you know, colleagues, scientists, researchers all around the world. And we, we constantly like understand how to use big data and generate meaningful experiences. We are heavily also using game engine uh, installations. We are trying to explore gamification of pigmentation. We are trying to generate experiences that are barely visible to the public. We work with like institutions with neuroscience. Uh, we are kind of, you know, speculating the era between neuroscience, AI and architecture. As a team, we are not only just working with those, you know, institutions, we are trying to ask big questions or questions that they couldn't ask before. So we are becoming this, you know, entity between the unknown nature of questions for scientists and trying to like connect the bridge between art, science and technology. But what was really changed my, I think, trajectory is uh, basically 2016, I was very fortunate to get an inv invitation from Google and a, a group called Artists and Mission Intelligence. Thanks to Kenrick McDowell and Mike Taika, me and my team were the, one of the first generation artists in residence at Google that were able to use how to, basically machine learning algorithms to generate artworks. The first work was called Archive Dreaming. It was in Istanbul. And the idea was generating an installation inside a library that is open to anyone. And we use AI algorithms to generate an experience inside the library where people can witness how AI can learn. But the question is, if a machine can learn, can it dream? And I guess this question has always comes to me in my mind as a, like a sci-fi lover. And last four or five years, I've been constantly you know, asking this question to, to myself, to my team members, and generating experiences with big data sets. And especially if you see here, my specific focus is into collective memories. So first of all, for me, data is not a bunch of numbers. For me, data is a collective, it's, it's a memory. But I am trying to learn what happens if we detach ego from data, basically, not use personal data. Is there any other ways of using collective memories of humanity, such as space, time, and nature? and generate new ways of narratives with the help of machine learning algorithms. I've been exploring big data sets in, in terms of data universes. I've been working with institutions as a, as a team and like try to give them insights about their data and generate machine hallucinations. So machine hallucinations are inspiring research that have been going thanks to friends at NVIDIA. And, and um, we are using GAN algorithms, as you see here, which is a ways of generating synthetic data based on big information that what the machine learned from. So this is, I think, 2000, um, 2016, when the, the inception or deep dream for Google friends, when they released their code, it was a remarkable moment. We were able to see the machine is dreaming or hallucinating some kind of like animals <laughs> that doesn't exist. And for me, that was like a moment that what happens if I take a similar algorithm, but apply to the cities, the nature, urban, 
and locations that, or nature, I mean, as you see here, and try to generate new ways of latent cinema. And this became our studio's signature research last five years, I guess, in 2016. And we have been constantly training neural networks with different body of work and big data. And recently, actually, I mean, it's last year, we were able to create a project in New York in Chelsea Market at Artec House. And we were able to create a narrative by using 18 channel projectors where people can step inside the space and witness the storytelling and using neural networks as a mean of pigmentation. People were able to see how machine can work and how it can become a space and especially how you can go beyond two dimensional universe of cinema. I do believe that immersive storytelling is heavily, heavily inspiring. And I do believe that we have a huge opportunity once we start to work with machine learning algorithms and once we embed media arts into architecture. As you see here, we are witnessing audience stepping inside the story and witnessing going through different neural networks and exploring different feeling of immersion. And I do believe that, of course, AR, VR and XR is an incredibly inspiring process, but I do not believe we explore every single idea yet. So the original maybe experiences is like goes back to 1958, Philippe Pavillon, where Zanakis and Le Corbusier was exploring a similar idea inside the Philippe Pavillon in Brussels. And I was super inspired by their research, but especially one of the reasons I decided to come to UCLA was also follow light and space movement. I was heavily inspired by James Turrell, Robert Irvin, and Dan Flamin. And I was always like understanding, trying to understand how can I take their legacy and apply a whole new dimension by using light, AI, architecture, and neuroscience. The project you are seeing here have been witnessed more than 100,000 people. And then we are currently working with a similar project in Istanbul, in Seoul, in Dubai, and many other locations. So I can easily say that this is a becoming a new ways of storytelling in the age of mission intelligence. And then recently, we were also very fortunate, worked with Google AI quantum team. And as, you, as, I, as I mentioned before, we have wonderful collaborators from mostly like a tech giants, and they're constantly looking for new ways of asking questions. And the team Google AI Quantum, which is from Santa Barbara, they were able to create a quantum supervised test where they were able to create a test setup that a quantum computer was able to perform an, a unique task that cannot be done for a thousand years with a classical computer. It was a validation of quantum computation. And if you look at quantum physics, which is incredibly inspiring field of research in science, or maybe you remember Alex Greenland's devs, there is this inspiring story called uh, it's a research called Many Worlds Interpretation by Hugh Everett. In a very high level thing, whenever we did this, whenever we do a subatomic calculation in quantum physics, there's an opportunity to open a new dimension or multiple dimensions. And I was very curious that, as we all know, we always need machines, right? In humanity, DTI, fMRI, EEG, microscope, telescopes. We constantly need cars and phones and computers. We constantly need machines to survive and at least make the leap, a big leap for humanity. And I thought, what will happen if you use AI to show us these invisible patterns inside the quantum mechanics or specifically quantum noise and inspire an AI that is trained with 200 million nature photos and let AI to find a pattern of visualization that transform into quantum memories. The project was still open in uh, National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. Even in COVID, we were very lucky. We were able to like witness uh, some really challenging installation. And what you are seeing is a 10 meter by 10 meter ultra high resolution screen where people can explore this concept. There is more than 200 million particles in the sea. And the music is also coming from the AI.
and the project is real. It's not just a render. <laughs> so let me just show you how it looks like in the space. And it's open to public. And so far, Melbourne is doing a great job during the pandemic. And it's open, and the people are going and exploring the piece. And lastly, I want to show you a project that is very important for me that I believe that can be an inspiring topic to discuss together. 2012, when I come to Los Angeles as a student, as a, as a media artist student, by the way, I got my first MFA degree also in um, visual communication design from Istanbul. And I was able to work on multiple different scale of architectural buildings all over the world. But I was not super inspired by just using a projection on a building. And I was a little bit almost bored doing a similar project all over the world. And when I came to Los Angeles, the first thing I did is rent a car and go to downtown Los Angeles and see this beautiful building, Frank Gehry's Walt Disney Concert Hall. And this building is home of LA Philharmonic. And as I, as I am in love with architecture and my heroes, like such as Frank Gehry, Zaha Hadid, Tado Ando, and Toyo Ito, I was just mesmerized being able to like go and see this building. And when I go there and when I see the building, it was just an amazing moment, but also very sad because I was there at 2 a.m. and it was so dark. And I was expecting something very shiny, beautiful, this, you know, futuristic, amazing building versus I saw just a dark, you know, nothing. And at that night, I was very sure that I was 100 sure that, of course, you know, remembering William Gibson, the Neuromancer, or, you know, Philip K. Dick like pieces. I was one hundred sure about that. Can a building learn? Can it dream? Was the question I ask. By the way, as a student, of course, I got like hit many balls because I mean, many mentors were saying like, "Are you crazy? Like, you cannot do this project. Like, you're a student with like a working visa. You don't have a working visa. You cannot like get permission." At the meantime, I was emailing Frank Gehry. I was emailing LA Philharmonic. I was emailing City of Los Angeles, saying like, "Hey, like, I want to do this," and of course, nobody replied my email. But in 2013, there was something very unique happen. I was, in, I was invited to the Microsoft Research in Seattle, and there was a great exhibition or competition between many other Ivy League schools. And everyone were on the stage, like an elevator pitch, very cliche. And people were like, you know, other schools were super cliche with eight people, like a roving team. And they were like sharing their like, I mean, no offense, but super predictable startup ideas. And I was the only one without any remembered, like any memorized words. And I was just there with my short alone and saying, can a building learn, can it dream? And I later learned that Bill Gates was also in the jury and I got accepted to their award and I got Best Vision Award. And this award allowed me to create a three-dimensional sculpture. And of course, when I got the award, thanks to Greg Lean and many of Dennis Sheldon at Gear Technologies, they shared the 3D model of the building. This happened in 2014. But it took four years, LA Philharmonic, to find a reason to make this project. And in 2018, they decided to create a piece of experience. And instead of doing a cliche like, you know, fireworks, the LA Phil was looking for something meaningful, something purposeful for their next 100 years. And for this, they invited me and my team, and thanks to Frank Gehry, LA Philharmonic, and City of Los Angeles, we were able to work with memories of LA Philharmonic. I challenged the institution and the archives of LA Phil to get every single digital data that I can find. So if you think about an institution of 100 years, it's a lot of data. It's more than 77 terabytes of raw data. And there's incredible sound information, like around 77,000 audio recordings. If you want to listen to them, it will take 38, 37 years. And if you look at the, only the images or, or the video files that ever recorded, each of them is around you know, two hours we had 90,000 video files. And then we had around like a half million images ever recorded inside the building. I mean, if you imagine, we were able to access every single memory of the building, photographic memory of the building. And plus we have, of course, Frank Gehry's original files, lookup sheets, meaning like since, since 1919, every single LA field performance ever recorded on a paper. And of course they were also in digitized versions. So simply every single decision of the institution was in our hands. The challenge was not only the data, but the canvas. Like how on earth could we take this amazing building into a canvas? And for this, we find 13 unique locations and each location had four projectors, which made 42 
unique projection surfaces. And this was a massive challenge. And believe me, like cabling, angling, focusing, and all sorts of like challenges were in our hands. But the good news, we had an incredible collaborators. LA Field was super helpful. We had a fantastic projections team and the city of Los Angeles also helped us a lot to make a public art free for everyone. And the, and the other challenge was of course the 3D model. The building is designed in a Katia, a software that as a pioneered Frank Gehry's, um, um, I think carrier, this, um, this software allows um, Frank Gehry and his team to calculate the uh, material details, which was a remarkably pioneering process. But the model is not, you know, 2002 is a very, very old model that doesn't help me or my team to use them immediately. So we had to take this model and reconstruct it. So that was a really big challenge. So as you see here, we took the Rhino model, 3D file, and then reconstruct every single details, facade, surface, layers, like structural engineering behind them. I mean, imagining alternative materials, even ask question, you know, what happens if AI takes this data and even reconstruct some exciting hallucinative like structures as you see here. Once we have that, of course, it became a truly three-dimensional augmentation. And projection mapping is also a very challenging process if you are going through these, you know, complex 3D modeling steps and processes. And then later, we also got, as I mentioned, 100 years of every single decisions of the institution. This also comes with like concert seasons that we were able to like see like who played when, which venue, which conductor, which piece and so on. And we did this for hundred years. And once we have this data, we transform it into a three dimensional space that we were able to like fly in the every decision of the institution in 3D space and later projected back to the building itself. And later, of course, we also look which conductor played which piece and how many times. So we were constantly looking and understanding the relationship between the human decisions and how can we use AI to find those patterns and transform them into a pigmentation. And later, we also think about what happens if AI goes to a concert. The project was a collaboration between Google Arts and Culture, which allowed me and my team to look at the incredible information inside LFL archives. By the help of Google, we were able to look at these, three, these, these 2D surfaces and photos and videos, and we classify every single image in the archive. And then we were able to get these exciting forms, which I am calling data universes. So what you are seeing is AI is defining the similarities between millions of images by using neural networks, VDG16, which was a free uh, and publicly open um, uh, image re recognition algorithm that allowed us to generate those 3D space and generate some kind of a data universe that later became pigmented in the building. And these materials were so inspiring, but also we did the same thing for audio. I mean, the archives was incredible and we were able to generate an, a really, really fun tool with Parag Mittal that was able to listen all the pieces ever recorded. And each, by the way, particle is a 10 seconds data. And then each of them listened by AI and clustered by similarity. So the colors represent similar you know, instruments, human voice, and so on. And later on, they became a pigment on the building itself. And also later, we use the same model to generate realistic sound samples. But the fun thing is, of course, generating these data sculptures or data spaces or data universes, which they also became these very exciting abstract points and lines. So I'm calling them machine decisions. Every single cluster is based on like the, the historical, you know, decisions of the machine and each of them clustered by similarities. And as I mentioned the sound, right, that we have this incredibly inspiring, massive sound archive from Hollywood Bowl to like, again, like years of years of information. 
And our algorithm were easily understand this hundred years of information, seven terabytes of audio. And we were able to characterize like 256 different attributes, such as like a pitch, timbre, amplitude, tempo, tonality, and key, and so on. And then later on, we took this data, which is, you know, multidimensional information. By the way, when AI learns information, it stores data in a place called latent space. And latent space is a kind of a manifold space, a mathematical space that we cannot perceive. It's an abstract space that you have to ask a question to be able to learn. So what we did is use a, an algorithm called UMAP, which is a manifold projection technique, that allowed us to 3D you know, project this data into a space and use six dimensional information and map red, green, and blue data into the points. And that gave us these three dimensional sculptures. And then later, we were able to also ask the question, if one day, if a building could remember or have consciousness, what happens if it asks, do I need to look like this? <laughs> and to answer this question, we were able to download every single available photo of the building. And then this data trained a neural network called PGGAN. And that PGGAN data fed into another algorithm, a height map algorithm. That transformed into this two dimensional. And they became pigment of the building. Now, music is also hallucination. It's not real. Imagine an AI learns 100 years of every single sound data and hallucinate music like very heavenly and while the building is dreaming that was the concept behind the last chapter it became installation downtown Los Angeles 2018 over now I want to show you the last chapter of the installation and then hopefully get your questions it is called dreams the last section of the performance watched by more than 100,000 people in 2018, downtown Los Angeles.
So this moment was roughly watched by 100,000 people. It was a free public art for anyone, any age, and any background. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take your question. And I think I'm on time for 35 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that talk. Um, it, it was really fascinating and inspiring. And I know that our students really appreciated seeing the trajectory of your work. We're joined now for our Q&A by Prof Professors Kohar Scott and Yoon Chung Han from our design department. Um, we're also taking questions from students. So anyone who has any questions, please use the Q&A function below and write them out for us. Okay, looks like we have one right off the bat uh, from John Hoffman. How exactly does the music get synthesized into something rhythmic and melodical from previous sound? Great question. So there are incredible algorithms, especially designed by friends at Google. <coughs> Sorry. It's called in Magenta. Magenta is an open source, amazing researchers, um, and Doug Egg is one of the uh, lead researchers. And they allowed me and many artists to use their tools. It is basically a recurrent neural network that allows you to like synthesize amazing samples. But of course, over the last 10 years, I was able to generate many softwares, not only just that. And those samples also go through other data sonification. So for example, like, and, and AI doesn't have a context of, you know, scale or, you know, timbre or still a human has to like, you know, augment that specific output. So for example, my colleague, Kerim Karolu and Robert Thomas, they were together have been working with those outputs from the machine to compose the pieces. Also LA Phil helped us a lot because they were really looking for meaningful outputs because it's super weird. Like it feels like a Mahler, but it's like a Stravinsky, but it is like a Beethoven, but it's a little bit like a, you know, Mozart. It was a very weird feeling to be honest. It's a really hallucinative, you know, it's just, it, it, it was hard to group uh, perception wise. Um, so it was a really exciting research, um, I think. And it's very e emotional because they're, I mean, LA Phil decided to go with very emotional pieces over the years. So it's their decisions actually to in create an impact on the human mind and soul. And that's why the musics are, I think, more like that kind of emotional pattern. So like past inspires now makes future predictions. Thank you. I have a question. Um, thank you very much. It was a very inspiring, wonderful presentation that gave me greater insight into how you're developing what we're seeing. Um, one question I have is, do you in-rate or visualize these elaborate installations prior? Do you see it all ahead of time or is it fluid or how does it come about, particularly for the more abstract ones that we were seeing in the beginning? I think it's a great question. I mean, I mostly dream them and even visualize them way before, like way, way before the installation. And I think I mostly don't even start a project if I don't have that vision or, you know, emotional connection. Because over the years, I get many, many opportunities, but not all of them were inspiring or exciting. So not, not every building, not every data institution have a similar you know, impact. So it's kind of like a, like a symbiotic relationship between the data institution and the city. Um, so it's kind of like a really this, I think, poetic connectivity, emotional connectivity. Like, I mean, Los Angeles, right? The city I was in love with like, while I was a young, you know, child, child, and I was just like dreaming flying car on a facade. I mean, it's just so meaningful for me to like go back to that dream and try to reinvent it. It was just a very, you know, emotionally connection than just techno fetish, some shiny pixels. So that makes, I think, a big difference. And the other thing was very meaningful I mean, for example, in the, in the Gala Night, there was Alejandro Inharitu, like Spielberg and Ridley Scott and so on. Like when I, hear, when I hear from those heroes saying like, oh, wow, finally I can touch science fiction. Or when William Gibson was in New York inside Mission Hallucination was saying, oh, finally someone made a world that I feel I am in my, you know, stories. I mean, those are the most strongest, you know, reasons of making those moments. So like basically honoring the heroes, mentors and teachers in every single event, I guess. Thank you. Another question. Uh, let's see, let me read 
add a question from Layla Beverly, who's an animation and illustration faculty member. member. Uh, on these installations, which are fantastic, do you plan the colors as well? Yes, colors are super important. I think I have some obsession with colors over the years. First of all, I started my career as a photographer and doing only black and white photography for a long time. And I learned about Ansel Adams and zone system and all this obsession about the grayscale world of photography. I stuck there and I'm only wearing black, by the way, probably because of that. And then, and then over the years, I found out that actually the color is extremely meaningful from a perception point of view, emotional point of view, but I couldn't find the meaningful decisions. But then once the data starts to come into my you know, collaboration tool, it was getting much easier. For example, when I did the wind data paintings, I found the, you know, the ocean, the sky, the blue as like one of that you know, pattern. And recently when I work with AI algorithms, so I have this obsession with fluid dynamics in my work, you can feel it for eight, nine years. For example, I'm you know, running those fluid dynamics with GAN algorithms where the color is coming from machine decisions. So if I'm, you know, imagine um, every single photo ever taken from Nar Mars surface, right? 12 terabytes of every single photos and imagine AI dreaming Mars or imagine Hubble telescope, right? It's dreaming the every single telescope data, like thousands of years of, you know, <laughs> time away from us, the galaxy's memories. So, I mean, I, or nature or flowers, I mean, or water or clouds. Like I'm just trying my best to use collective memory as an input for machine that inspires the color and do that collaboration in the pigmentation process. I have a question. So I'm a big fan of your work and you know, yeah. uh, I visit the art tech house in the, like two years ago in New York yeah. and it's so mesmerized. And then, you know, uh, I'm not sure you remember, but uh, we had your work and the i 2 this art program before. So it was really fantastic. Thank you. Um, yeah, so one question is about the interactivity. You know, you uh, use the, uh, already there's a kind of interactivity, you know, analyze the, the data through AI algorithms and then, you know, uh, but uh, mostly it's like a kind of, you know, it seems like, you know, uh, it's a kind of pre-generated images and videos. I'm wondering if you uh, have a touch base on the kind of interactivity between yeah. uh, your work and then uh, audience members in the, the, the space. Yeah. Yes, I mean, my piece in 2014 at, at LA again was a real-time piece, listening eight, eight channel music from 110 musicians in real time. And mm -hmm. I have some piece in Auckland, for example, called Sense of Place where the real-time data from the wind patterns, rain and you know, um, other environmental data inspires the artwork or Wi-Fi, LTE, Bluetooth signals as well. So I have pieces real-time running and visualizing the invisible patterns of life in other scale. Uh, thank you. Here's another question from Ian Dang. Do the images generated by the AI become a part of the data or does it only take real life data? Can AI dreams build from their previous dreams? Ah, great question. So at the moment, these GAN algorithms, um, literally, I think it's a pretty much a very simple process. Like imagine that there's two algorithms, one is generated, one is um, a discriminator. And one knows what is real, what doesn't know nothing. And the one that doesn't know, try to fool the other network and the other network tries to learn what is real. So it's simply we are capturing a dialogue between two neural network in a high level domain. At the moment, machines doesn't decide to decide yet. That's why a human has to intervene and then give a decision for a machine to go in certain space in latent space. So what I did over the last three, four years with my team is write, wrote another algorithm that allows me to use a joystick and fly literally in the mind of a machine and find those patterns and let machine to complete in between. And when machine, comp like imagine, let's say, you know, Renaissance, right? So we have every single sculpture ever recorded in Renaissance or painting or literature or architecture, right? And then we just ask AI to learn from them. But what is cool is like in architecture, you can go to like the facade and then click and go to interior, click, go to like a window, click, and AI can complete in between lines. And that is, I think, where I feel machine hallucination happens. So human intervenes, machine decisions, if it makes sense. Thank you. A uh, question from Robin Lasser, who is a photography faculty member at SJSU. Can you talk about the heroic and how, if this plays into your dreams and the dreams of the structures you project on? 
Oh, amazing question. I mean, I do also believe in this is a moment. So I, 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 I believe that, I mean, first of all, when I was thinking about like collective memories of humanity, and I still believe the photography is the most utmost important memory of humanity. I mean, yes, we are using social media and so on, like to take our life or life taking processes. But I also think that like, I mean, instead of like having those fears of ramification with systems, I found that asking what else can we do with that brings much more inspiring and exciting outputs. I mean, same thing here, I guess, like in my dreams, I'm constantly like seeing and feeling all these like collective memories. Um, because I think when we detach ego from data, we have something much inspiring. I think something that is, I mean, hopefully important for collective, you know, consciousness and eventually collective dreams. So it's more, I mean, it's not me, but it's more us. Like how can we, you know, see a similar idea from the perspective of something has much more objective power. Um, even though what is objective in the, in the age of mission intelligence is a big question, but I feel like this, this is a moment of a person's, you know, this is a um, moment of a photographer's memory reclustered by AI and turning into another memory input for AI to dream to me is very inspiring. I think that's, I think where that structure comes. Uh, and again, the good news architecture like is very inspiring as a whole, like a building <laughs> interior, exterior can be so fun to explore. So honestly, architecture is inspiring as well. Another question here from John Hoffman. Beautiful and inspiring. Would algorithms of this caliber be able to give way to an organization of consciousness within a computer? Mm. It's a great question. So I think um, from a quantum perspective, from a neuroscientific perspective, I don't think we can still compute or measure consciousness. It's still something abstract for many scientists that is hard to you know, convince at least <laughs> some communities. So I, my feeling is we don't see any conscious machine um, very soon because we don't know what is consciousness. So I don't think machines can you know, mimic a thing that we don't know what it is. So that's good news, I guess, for a while. <laughs> but at the meantime, I'm sure um, researchers are you know, speculating the moment of conscious moments, like machine decisions are becoming exciting, like deep dreams, I'm sorry, um, deep mind team is doing incredible work on protein folding, like AlphaGo and many others. So there are some inspiring project, you know, making a big leap to understand how can machine decisions can be, you know, helpful for humanity, especially for, you know, cancer, Alzheimer demand and many other, you know, uh, issues of things that couldn't be solved due to like a level, lack of, you know, computation. So my feeling is, while we are waiting to understand what is consciousness, I think we will use machines to solve other problems that will be much important for humanity. But it's my high level guess. I'm not sure if it's true. Thank yes. you. Well, I, I know that um... If you're, you're kind of, you're, you're running off, you need to get a COVID test after yeah. your uh, after your travel. So if Kahar, you know, if you have any final questions. By the uh, way, please. by the way, you are very welcome to watch on my website. Many of these pieces are available and, um, and I can write here. I don't know where to write, but in the panelist or to maybe. Um, so you can put any links in the chat um, and this presentation will also be available on the gallery YouTube page in just a few weeks. So I'll, I can send a note to all of our faculty members who'd like to, to rewatch and to share this with students. I have one super quick question. I uh, just uh, wondering, you know, any kind of tip to run your studio because, you know, like uh, having a lot of cool team members in your you know, team and they make it happen and then it must be pretty tough, you know, when you start working on it, right? Like uh, getting funding or, you know, uh, facilitating the team. So I'm wondering okay. if because there are many art students here. So they, it's your kind of dream, you know? <laughs> so I wonder if you can share some tip or, uh, yeah. Thank you. Sure, I mean, very openly, we are nerds. Like we are all nerds. We love to code. <laughs> we love to work with computers. We don't want to sleep before solving a problem. It's just a different like we love gamification, we love asking hard questions. I mean, no offense, but academy is sometimes too slow for those questions. <laughs> so we did, we did our own academy here in house to just you know create our own 
breakthroughs internally. Um, and sometimes uh, we had we hit heavy walls and we are failing a lot, to be honest. Like I may be smiling and showing good projects, but believe me, majority of projects are failing a lot. But it's beautiful because when you fail, and honestly, I learn more than ever than making a beautiful project and get no feedback. So um, many of our success comes from epic failures <laughs> very often. But also um, what is really beautiful is like being able to work with ego-free environments. Um, so uh, we have a horizontal studio. We only do art. We have zero like, you know, commercial interest. In, we, we never move a logo A to B. So it's like, you know, we never use personal data. We have ethics applied. We're careful about nature. You know, we worry about, you know, humanity's future. We are not like egocentric place just to get, you know, uh, eagerly get new projects. No, like we are very selective. Um, that little brings us in a different situation from many art studios. And I, I think if you look at early, you know, like if you look at end of our whole factory, right? Or early 80s, 90s, 1900s, it was a very similar vibe, right? But then of course the pigment, the brush or the like sculpture was the challenge for artists. But now the code, the data, computation, you know, uh, literature I mean, many different challenges we have here so it's a very i think learning to learn is the answer so you don't have like any like you know uh we can work with the quantum quantum physics without any doubt like we just deep dive like a bungee jumping uh we don't like fear about learning but we just you know fear about not asking the good question um so when you when you are on that mindset and believe me things moving so fast and if your ideas are fresh the world knows that they are fresh um, so yes, you can have copycats, you can have the same things, it's great, like let the world know, um, but you know, it's, I think academic responsibility of life is amazing, reference culture is amazing, um, so we just follow those, you know, it, 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 just, just respecting our heroes, mentors, and teachers, I guess, in our every single step um, that brought that beautiful energy to studio, I guess. Great, thank you so much, yeah. I'm wishing everyone a good luck. And um, maybe after COVID, you are welcome to visit our studio. We have robots, we have lots of computers, as you may guess, like lots of. Um, and also for friends who are starting to like work with, you know, computation or algorithms, I heavily advise you to look for game engines like Unreal Engine, Unity. They are incredibly powerful tools. Uh, you can make some remarkably exciting projects without, you know, writing too much code, but diving into other design elements in life. Uh, so heavily advice. And if you want to learn uh, AI, there's a website called Runway ML. Um, it's a beautiful website that allows you to create similar, you know, AI experiments without using millions of image, of course. But these are, these are fun to start with uh, for your experiments, maybe in summer too. Thank Wonderful. you so much. <laughs> go ahead, go <laughs> uh, No, I was, I was just saying thank you so much for those um, beginner tips as well, because I know that for, for some of our students, we'll be starting from scratch too. Amazing. Yeah, hope to have you in physical world to see you or witness one of our projects and good luck with the journey. Be careful about these yeah. hard days. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Rafiq. Um, after your travels with, you know, we we definitely could not feel the jet lag through your incredible energy that you oh, brought that's to great. this. I'm just like, <laughs> it's really been a pleasure seeing your work and hearing you talk about the way in which you work and the incredible respect that you have for your mentors and and for all of the the roots of um, of your work. So. I see the entire chat just lighting up with thank yous all the way around. Um, and if you were here in person, we'd give you a round of applause, but we look forward to someday seeing you on our campus yes. as well. Hopefully, hopefully. Have a wonderful week and stay safe. Great to meet you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye-bye.